Hello and welcome to Useful Idiots. I'm Katie Halper. And I'm Mary Matte. Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us. As always, our website, usefulidiotspodcast.com. Go there, support the show, keep it going. And on top of it, get bonus content. Yeah, like extended interviews and our Thursday throwdown, your midweek dose of media madness, which is always a good time and which is when we try to laugh instead of cry at the media. So let's get started off with the four basic food groups. And I got Democrats suck this week. So let's take a look at a clip of Joe Biden, where he is speaking at a campaign event in Las Vegas. This is from Sunday. And he's recounting a group uh, of seven G7 meeting he attended after being elected in 2020. Let's take a listen. You know, I, right, right, right after I was elected, I went to a, what they call a G7 meeting, all the NATO leaders. It was in it was in the south of England. And I sat down and I said, America's back. And Mitterrand from Germany, I mean, from France, looked at me and said, uh, said, you know, what, why, how, how long are you back for? So the only problem is he appeared to mix up uh, French President Emmanuel Macron with Francis Mitterrand. Uh, the former president of France who died in 1996. That's what happens when you're an experienced politician like Joe Biden. You know, you've just gone to so right. many meetings that you've accomplished so many things in your long career of warmongering and right. exactly. growing foreign countries and locking people up in prison. You just, you lose track of some of the people along the way. Uh, you know, look, Mitterrand was the French president between 1981 and 1995. 1995 is not that long ago. And he says he's the German chancellor, whatever, whatever, it's fine. He's a creative <laughs> yeah. thinker, nonlinear thinker, thinks yes. outside the box. Yeah. And yeah. that's actually, sadly enough, not the only uh, stone moment for Joe Biden. Let's take a look at what he had to say when he was asked about the progress of a proposed truce deal for Israel's war on Gaza. There is some movement, and I don't want to, I don't want to. I mean, choose my words. There's some movement. There's been a response from the, uh, the, the there's been a response from the opposition. But um, it, it, yes, I'm sorry, from Hamas. But it seems to be. Uh, a little over the top. We're not sure where it is. There's a continuing negotiation right now. So uh, he's at a loss for words because things are so dire right now. That must be it. He's speechless uh, because things are so dire. He's speechless over the genocide. No, we know that he's not speechless over the genocide because he's happy uh, drumming support up for the genocide. What happened there was he just forgot the name of Hamas. So yeah, he calls the him opposition. the opposition. The opposition, yeah. That's his opposition. He rules over Israel Palestine. And inside Israel Palestine, his opposition is Hamas. So, you know, right. totally fair. Because his allies are allies are Israel, obviously. Exactly. Makes no bones yeah. about that. And then he calls Hamas's counterproposal on a ceasefire over the top. Like, what is he <laughs> what's he talking about? Yeah, like, what Hamas, it's such a weird way to describe a position. Yeah. Hamas proposed, like, first we'll release all the women and children, and you'll do the same because there are thousands of Palestinian women and children in Israeli prisons. And then we'll go on to a new phase, and then we'll have a permanent ceasefire. Um, Whoa, <laughs> sounds really over the top. That's yeah. too much. That's you're you're here. Where you want to be at? A, you're at eleven, buddy. Yeah. Calm down. I, God forbid think, you get. God forbid you release the hostages and end the war. That would be exactly. that's way too over the top. Let's let's be rational, calm. And keep going on with this genocide. Yes. I think because Hamas keeps insisting on parity, on treating everybody as equal. So, for example, if we're going to release our hostages, you have to release yours, including your right. women and children that you've kidnapped from us. That's over the top for Biden, who they, does. They want they do, want parity, and Biden wants parity. Biden is parity. Sure. P-A-R-O-D-Y. Exactly. Yeah. And so if you if you try to treat them as equal human beings, Palestinians as equal human beings, over the top, the wacky. Over the top. The wacky yeah, opposition. Wacky, quirky. Eccentric. What are you doing? Be serious, guys. Be serious. Mm -hmm. Lay down uh, your arms and be bulldozed. Absolutely disgusting. So because of Biden's uh, senior moments, Donald Trump has made the following campaign ad. At White House Senior Living, our residents feel right at home. 
Our vibrant facility offers delightful activities and outings, round-the-clock professional care, and exquisite house-made meals. Well, I've been eating everything that's put in front of me, but I've been eating all, all Italian food, basically. And ice cream. And ice cream, chocolate chip ice cream. White House Senior Living, where residents feel like presidents. If, if somebody was being really cynical, they could counter with plenty of Trump oh, yeah. moments of cognitive decline, too, which he's showing right. more recently. I mean, in terms of who's in the lead, Joe Biden definitely is in the lead in terms of more yeah. uh, moments of uh, apparent senility. But uh, definitely Trump is not that far is not that far behind, in fairness to Joe right. Biden. Pretty good. Pretty uh, head to head. Head to head race. That's what a presidential race is all about, is uh, who has less cognitive decline. Okay, for Republican suck, let's turn to a bizarre moment that happened on Fox News during the Sean Hannity show. Um, Hannity is really into this surge of migrants who have been fleeing desperation in their home countries and coming to cities like New York. So we interviewed this guy, Curtis Silva, who is a uh, right-wing activist and founder of the group The Guardian Angels, which bills itself as a, a crime prevention group. But really, a lot of what they're doing is just going around and harassing people, especially undocumented immigrants. And so one such incident was captured live on Fox News as Curtis Slua spoke to Sean Hannity. If you divide 53 million by 500, that's a $106,000 debit card. Not a bad deal. I don't think they're giving them to, to, to vets that are homeless in New York City. Not that I've heard, Curtis. Well, in fact, our guys have just taken down one of the migrant guys right here on the corner, 42nd and 7th, while all can, this Can you is pan taken. the camera? They've taken over. They've taken over. You'd like the camera over there if at all possible. Yep. Oh, you got your key open, guys. So for our audio audience... The camera has panned over now to a bunch of guys in Guardian Angels garb, and they're basically harassing uh, what appears to be a migrant for reasons that are unexplained. So basically, we're watching an assault on live TV, and we're supposed to cheer this on. Out of control. There. All right. Now, Eric Adams often complains he's getting no support from the federal government to help him with the surge of Joe Biden's unvetted illegals in New York. And that could be because of the so-called border czar is a little distracted right now. According to a report, Vice President Harris has now suddenly, quote, found her footing. So anyway, yeah, we're just uh, watching a guy get assaulted on live TV. Yeah, and, it's uh, not just harassment. It's physical assault. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, really disgusting. Yeah. Like that should yeah. be evidence for the arrest of the guardian angels. Yes. Who are pathetic, Arrest insecure men who walk around in ridiculous red caps and red jackets. Uh, and really, they ha saw their heyday during the 80s. And uh, he ran for mayor, by the way, Sliwa. Was oh, trounced. No huh. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. But well, Sean Hannity is should, like, of course, he's not embarrassed showing crimes on his show because he thinks these, he celebrates these crimes. Yeah, no. Uh, har harassment, assaulting an undocumented migrant by, by, by a, ga a gang is, is okay. totally fine. And, you know, Katie, also you know, so cowardly, like pick on someone your own size. How about instead of surrounding one person with like a dozen people? Uh, yeah, sure. No, definitely. Uh, it's, it's ridiculous. And, you know, there are people in our audience who, who have really mixed feelings about this whole issue of undocumented immigration. And to be honest, you know, I don't know what the answer is. Uh, I understand the argument from people who feel as if it, you know, uh, unfettered immigration hurts working class people because it means there are less jobs to go around. I, you know, I, I don't want to dismiss that. What I do know is, what, one thing I do know is that if we weren't sanctioning and regime changing all these countries around the world, there wouldn't be such a surge of people trying to flee. And uh, this week on Monday morning, we heard a clip from David Frum, the veteran neocon pundit, veteran of the, of the Bush of the George W. Bush administration, saying that the reason why there's so much migration right now is because there's so much prosperity. So people can afford to like pay thousands of dollars to go seek a better life in the US, which of course is is ridiculous. But what I do know is if we weren't interfering in all these other places, there they wouldn't be fleeing. And do we have an obligation 
towards people whose countries we've destroyed. I think we do. You know, I, I just don't think yeah. we can turn people away, uh, especially if our policies like sanctions that destroy economies deliberately are a major factor in them trying to flee. Yeah. And also, I mean, there's a lot to be said on this, but another issue is, so yeah, we destabilize or destroy these countries from which they flee, or we sanction them, uh, which destroys them or harms them greatly. But there's also the issue of uh, undocumented people. People always point out how they harm the economy or take away jobs. They also pay into social security, which they don't get any benefits from when they're undocumented. And the other thing is the real solution to this is just having fairer labor laws and paying higher wages. And it's kind of pitting the working class against um, like the native, quote unquote, you know, U.S. born working class against uh, a working class that travels from other countries. And the solution lies elsewhere. It's not in banning people from coming. Uh, it's, it's from having a stronger labor movement and uh, advocating for a living wage for all. There's a new book on this by John Washington, who's a journalist. It's called The Case for Open Borders. And maybe we can have him on uh, yeah, to make the case because it. it sounds very interesting. Yeah. All right. You, you got to see how the sausage is made, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> we just figured out who to invite onto the show. Great. <laughs> and an update to this Republican suck, because after we recorded it, we realized that actually this person who Fox News claimed was a migrant uh, who was being assaulted on live TV is not actually a migrant. He's from the Bronx. He's a U.S. citizen from the Bronx who these people in the so-called Guardian Angels decided to just assault uh, on live television. And of course, even if you were a migrant, that wouldn't justify doing anything to him whatsoever. Um, but just to show how racist these people are, they just assumed, I suppose, that a guy with darker skin than them is a migrant, uh, even though he comes from the Bronx. So there we go. Okay, what do we have for Isn't That Weird? So for Isn't That Weird, we have a story from UPI News, which is a great site, especially for weird news. Company offers to, quote, scrap your ex, end quote, for Valentine's Day. Very timely, of course. A car scrapping company in Britain is offering jilted exes the chance to send former lovers to the junk heap for Valentine's Day. Scrap Car Comparison announced that Scrap Your Ex program will allow people to have cars named after their exes before being sent to the scrap heap. And a scrap heap, of course, is the junkyard, is what we, we in the United States call it, the junkyard. And here's what the uh, company is saying. Offering a unique form of car tharsis for anyone that has recently gone through a breakup, the Scrap Your Ex scheme is open for a limited time to anyone worldwide who wants to trash the memories of a past relationship or even nominate a friend's ex that deserves to be junked, the company said in a news release. Anyone seeking to have their ex scrap for Valentine's Day simply has to put their name into an online form and explain why their particular ex-lover deserves to end up in the dump. And then they write the, the name of the ex on the car uh, and... Uh, also, the person who nominated their ex for scrapping will receive photographic evidence of the dead. Unfortunately, all of us will likely have been through a breakup at some point in our lives, and we realize how hard it can be to get over and move on. We hope by providing this unique form of closure, symbolically scrapping an ex, will help people leave their heartbreak behind for good. So yeah, that sounds like a satisfying thing to do. I'm just a sucker for a good pun. So, you know, I wasn't on board with this idea until they dropped the catharsis. And then yeah, it's I realized, good, right? wow, this sounds fantastic. It's amazing yeah. what a what a good pun can do. Not to pontificate too much on that, but you're right. Pretty good. <laughs> Pretty good. Thank you. Pretty good. So what do we got for Isn't That Terrible? For Isn't That Terrible, I'm sorry to do this, but the category is called Isn't That Terrible? And this is the most terrible thing I've seen this week. Uh, we've done that. We featured before on the show the worst sketch comedy in the world, uh, which comes from Israel. Um, they're so bad, and they are coming from a place of being super defensive that they are committing a genocide in Gaza. And their way to handle this is in part to put out really awful sketch comedy trying to mock all of their critics around the world. So this is the latest iteration of this terrible pro-genocide genre of Israeli sketch comedy. Let's... Let's get through as much of this as we can. 
From the chicken to the fish, the kitchen will be clean, okay? Okay, okay. Salam Aleikum. Nice to kill you, meet you. My name is Muhammad, obviously, and I am the social media manager of Hamas. Welcome to our office. Let's go. Every morning, we start in the roulette room. Amir, how many people died yesterday? 43,954. Great. Nobody checks us. Sounds reliable. Post it. Do you want something to drink? There you go. In the past, there was Harlem Shake, Ice Bucket Challenge, Battle Flip. But today, today the trend is to shout Free Palestine. Hello, sweeties. What meaningless words did you learn today without knowing a bit of history? Zionist propaganda. Okay. Genocide denier. Wow, amazing. Now we organize a rooftop party for you, Gaza style. Wow, that's so amazing. Go, go, go. You're the best. Free Palestine. Yeah, yeah. Free Palestine, Free Britney. All the world's a stage, William Abu Shakespeare. And this brings us to the theater and drama room. Come. This is Gigi, this is Bella. Today, they are filming a new video. Action! More, more, more! More! Cry more, cry more! Your doll, your baby is hurt! Oscott, Oscott! It's a rap. It's, it's a donor, it's a donor. Our cyber room. Their job is to annoy people with stupid comments. Most of our bots are from Pakistan. You need to be more creative with your comments, or I will fire you, okay? All right, I mean, that's enough. Um, William Abu so Shakespeare. Terrible. Oh, they're so funny. So terrible. So funny. I mean, again, how sick of a society must you be when even Jews are not funny? Because, you know, Jews know. are they, they very, very funny. The Israelis. But right. they really ruin everything. Um, <laughs> they really, really do. I mean, the, the primary victims of Israel are, of course, Palestinians, but Jews also pay a price. Um, one in being associated with Israel, but two also in having their humor destroyed. Yeah. Well, thank you, but also no, no thank you to Stephanie Welch, who is a useful idiot audience member who sent that in. And we appreciate the suggestion, but also I'm so mad that I had to watch that because of you. Right. So, um, no, but seriously, thank you for saying that and, and, and keep them coming. Yeah, keep them coming. Because Lord knows Israel keeps them coming. Awful, just awful humor. So stupid. Oh my god. All right, and those are your four f basic food groups. For this week's guest, we are joined by Dennis Kucinich. He is the former mayor of Cleveland and a former member of Congress who's now running for Congress once again. He's been out of office for more than a decade, but now he is back running in Ohio's seventh district as an independent, not as a Democrat. Uh, the party that he previously served in. And full disclosure, I'm a huge fan of Dennis Kucinich. I've donated to his campaign, which you can do if you're interested at kucinich.com. He is a longtime champion of peace, stood up to wars under uh, Bill Clinton, under George W. Bush and Barack Obama. And I see him as a rare voice of conscience inside Congress. And that's one of the reasons I think he was chased out of Washington by his own party. And I'm very excited to see him try to come back in his bid for Congress. And Aaron does not live in Ohio. So you're a real true believer. I really am. You know, and I, usually I'm not a big fan of doing candidate interviews, but I know I had, yeah, to make it's an, not. I had to make an exception for Dennis Kucinich because of the service he's provided to not just this country, but to humanity for his whole career. So very excited to have him on. And a little uh, preview, you're going to see that I have some uh, lighting issues because of where I'm filming. There's no uh, curtains or blinds, and so the light is a little weird. But that's actually a perfect metaphor for Kucinich because he wrote a book called The Division of Light and Power. <laughs> so there you go. Well, what a tribute. What a tribute. You did yeah, your part. I okay. did. I did. Yeah. With your bad lighting. All right. Let's go to Dennis Kucinich. Thank you so much for joining us, Congressman Kucinich. Thanks, Katie. I uh, appreciate being on with you and Aaron, and I look forward to our discussion. So I thought a great way to start off would be by uh, showing people who you're running against, Max Miller, and explain why you were challenging him in Ohio's 7th District. So let's take a look at Max Miller's comments shortly after October 7th. Rashida Tlaib has the, I don't even want to call it the Palestinian flag because they're not a state, they're a territory that's about to probably get eviscerated and go away here shortly as we're going to turn that into a parking lot. That's one comment. Unless you think that was an isolated incident, let's hear some more from him on Israel and Palestine. Congressman, um, you know, 
you represent us here in America, but you have family in Israel. How are they holding up? What are you hearing from them on the ground? Lawrence, they're doing well, but when I woke up just a few days ago at around 5.30 a.m., I woke up to absolute horror. I woke up to my cell phone, text messages, pictures, phone calls. It's absolutely upsetting. What we're seeing here in the United States is not a true depiction of what is happening in Israel. These individuals are savages. Israel has taken a measured approach since 1948 in its inception as a country, and Israel is a country and will forever be the home of the Jewish state. I want to be something very clear. Israel needs to take the gloves off. Murder is murder and terrorism is terrorism. Turn the place into a parking lot. I believe Israel is going to get a lot bigger after this conflict as opposed to smaller. So why on earth would you want to run against this guy? He seems so great. Well, you know, the first thing I want to say about that is that after October 7th, emotions ran very high. And uh, I, I, you know, I myself felt very bad for the loss of life in Israel, it was horrible. But that doesn't justify what uh, Congressman Miller said, because it was a clear call for genocide. Uh, you know, a direct public incitement to genocide is forbidden by, by the Genocide Treaty of 1948. Uh, I think it's uh, Article 3, Section C. And uh, if genocide is actually committed uh, that kind of a statement could put one in, uh, in, in the ambit of prosecution uh, for complicity. So, you know, somebody can say, well, parking lot, what does that mean? Well, it is a euphemism. Anyone who hears someone say, particularly a member of Congress say, we are going to turn that into a parking lot, they understand very clearly it's a euphemism for genocide. And uh, I, I want to make one other point about this why it has added significance. In 1948, when the IDF, uh, uh, just nine days after Israel became a state, uh, the IDF went into a number of villages uh, among Palestinians and cleared the villages by basically murdering, you know, hundreds of people, if not more. Uh, one such village was Tantura. There's a docu documentary about it called Tantura. And what happened is they rounded up people in a square and they machine gunned them and dumped their bodies into a three foot ditch. Well, years later, people started to discover bones. They dug up and they found out there was evidence here of a massacre. What happened? <laughs> this ditch was paved over and it became a parking lot. So when someone's talked about, and, and certainly anyone who's familiar with the history of that time knows that there was Israeli scholars who had written about it and their work was basically expunged. But to say you're going to turn Gaza into a parking lot has great significance here because you're cle it's clearly a statement inciting genocide. Uh, and I understand strong feelings that happened at that time, but a member of Congress has to have uh, a little bit more discipline uh, in statements, and one must be very cautious when feelings are running high about incitement. And of course, I should just add, I also have relatives in Israel, and yet I don't want to turn Palestine into a parking lot in case people think that that's just what happens when you have relatives in Israel. Well, I, you know, again, I, will this be an issue in the election? I think it will, because it, it you know, people want individuals in Congress who uh, can uh, look at a crisis find a way to stop the bloodshed instead of accelerating it. And that's on both sides. Well, talk to us about your decision to run for office again. You've been out of Congress for a decade now, uh, previously well known for running as a presidential candidate in the Democratic primaries, uh, the leading voice for peace inside the Democratic Party, I would argue, during that era. Uh, but you've been out of office now for 10 years. So uh, what, what is bringing you back to the political field? Well, the, the times that we're in really require experience and knowledge and patience and a willingness to take a stand and speak the truth. And when my wife and I were talking to people about this race, uh, I was encouraged by the people in the district to run uh, because they feel like they haven't had uh, representation for a while. And so I decided, yes, I would step forward. Uh, why an independent? Because 47% of this district are independent voters. And I represented almost half of the district for 16 years uh, and served the people. 
uh, not only through my votes in Congress, but also 11,000 uh, cases a year. I had a staff of 14 at work time and a half on behalf of the people of the old 10th district. And so much of this territory is like a homecoming for me, but I'm, uh, I, I'm really focusing in this campaign on the issues of the economy, of what people are paying for the basic necessities of life, of uh, uh, housing, uh, the deficit, all of these endless wars keep getting put on a credit card and they're jeopardizing our country's financial security. So that, you know, in the time that we have here, I'm certainly happy to go over some of the details of the campaign, but my uh, reemergence is the result of looking at what's happening right now and saying, you know, this is a time to step forward. I can't stay on the sidelines with uh, what I believe America itself is at risk. In, in talking to people in your district, do you feel as if there's now more of an awareness uh, of the connection between fueling these endless wars abroad and deprivation at home? Oh, yeah. I think there's more and more people are aware that, for example, since 9-11, uh, we spent, according to the Watson Institute of Brown University, about $8.3 trillion that is added to our national debt for war. Uh, people are feeling a, a, a crunch. You know, their credit cards are going up, personal debt's going up uh, uh, considerably. I think it's uh, something like $17 trillion now. Uh, government debt's $34 trillion. We're really at a, at a very tentative and dangerous fiscal moment where the government isn't paying attention to the economic needs of people. And people are starting to wonder, well, why are we at war around the world? Why aren't we taking care of things here at home? What's with these almost 800 bases? Why are we going back to war in Iraq? Why are we bombing uh, Syria? What is this about attacking Yemen? We're escalating wars. Why? And how does this help America? And so these questions are being asked now, and I can promise you as a candidate for Congress, I am going to be taking these questions directly to people in my district because people are going to have a chance to vote on a new direction, which is independent of the parties, but which can give the parties some ideas about how to get out of this uh, uh, financial cul and and political and moral cul-de-sac, which America is in. Can you talk about your own personal history with economic precarity? I guess you could call it um, being unhoused yourself, uh, your family's struggles uh, economically, how those influence your view of the world and your view of what needs to be done? You never know when, it, when life brings you a gift when you're a kid. Uh, I grew up uh, the oldest of seven in the city of Cleveland. My family never owned a home. Uh, the kids came very fast, and uh, you know, we like a lot of families today, we kept falling behind. Um, by the time I was seventeen, we lived in twenty one different places, including a couple cars. So you know, Langston Hughes uh, once wrote, "Life for me ain't been no crystal stair." But you know, and my parents had a had a tough time. Um, but, you know, it's a blessing because it, it gave me an understanding of what people go through, of how people often struggle to try to make it and of, you know, what what it, it gave me an understanding of how government should have a role in people's life and to, to do for them collectively what they can't do for themselves individually, as Lincoln famously said, but also to create opportunities for people to, to help to move an economy so people don't have to worry about hanging by their fingernails so that everyone can have housing. I mean, right now, you know, I can go back to my own experience, but, I re but today housing ends up being one of the most critical issues in America. I, I think it was David Stockman recently uh, wrote that uh, in the last uh, 10, 10 years or something like that, the, co the median cost, the last five years, the median cost of housing has uh, gone up from, as, as a percentage of median income, has gone from 21% to 41%. And that is, and, and think of how many people are being denied a chance to, to own a home. How many young people can't even begin to even think about it? How many people are trapped in 
ever escalating rents. I mean, the, the, the idea of having a roof over your head, it is a, it, it's a human right, I would say. And people shouldn't be denied an opportunity for that. And if you don't have decent wages, if you don't have decent benefits, if you don't have access to child care, which is a increasing cost for a lot of young families, how do people make it? And see, so I'm attuned to that, Katie, because, yeah, I grew up in circumstances, you know, never took out the violin and say, woe is me, not a chance, because that was a, uh, uh, a honing experience that, you know, I look back at now with a sense of joy because it strengthened me to know that there are people are still out there who need a representative who's going to say, look, America ought to be focusing on our concerns here at home. We shouldn't be putting our nose in everybody's business all around the world, trying to tell them how to live, try to tell them what to do, spending money, arms, blowing up people everywhere, letting our own infrastructure rot. I mean, I, I just think that, you know, when you think about it, since since 9-11, all this money that's gone for wars, the average family of four, it's cost them like almost $100,000, 97000 to be exact. That's what they paid out for their cost of all these $8.3 trillion uh, that have gone for war. So, hey, uh, I'm still from the neighborhoods of Cleveland, Ohio. I live in the same house <laughs> that I bought in 1971 for $22,500. It's a 1,208 square foot house. And you know what? It's a working class neighborhood. I'm comfortable there. It's a four minute walk from the present uh, to the present district from my street. You know, I'm from the people. This is me. I, I don't have, there's nothing, you know, no frills, no varnish. The people can take it or leave it, uh, but this is who I am. If we're talking about your origin story in Cleveland, we have to talk about the time when you became a mayor at a very young age, at the age of 31, one of the youngest mayors in U.S. history. There's a lot to talk about there, but I, I just want to note the time when there's a story where the mafia took out a hit on you because you refused to sell off the Cleveland Utility Company. You refused to privatize it. Luckily, the mafia failed in their assassination <laughs> bid. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a long story, but I, I, later on, you were honored by the city years later because your decision, your refusal to sell out, saved the city tens of millions of dollars. Well, well, yeah, thanks for mentioning that. I, I will tell you this. You know, I, when I was elected mayor of Cleveland, I was the youngest mayor in the country. And I was elected on a promise to save Cleveland's municipal electric system, then known as Muni Light. Uh, what I didn't know at the time was that the biggest bank in Cleveland, Cleveland Trust, and the utility, uh, the Cleveland Electric Illuminating Company, all called First Energy, uh, they had interlocking directorates on their board. Uh, there are many ways they were the same company. And uh, so I was standing up to them, but I didn't know. I was taking on the entire Cleveland business establishment at the time, and some of their friends who were in illicit businesses in the mob. And at that time, you know, in 1976, Cleveland was known as the bombing capital of America. So no joke, there was a fierce war for control going on between various elements of the mob. And so here I get elected mayor. I take a stand against selling the system. I cancel it as soon as I'm elected. The story begins there because the bank starts to put pressure on me to sell. They threaten to call the city's loans, which they ultimately did. In the meantime, at three assassination attempts. I wrote a book about this. It's called The Division of Light and Power. It's a pretty long book, but it, it details this attempt to privatize a public power system. And there were hundreds of millions of dollars in public assets at stake. And I knew that. And because I, I'll share this with you very quickly. When I grew up in Cleveland, uh, I remember in one of these apartments we were at on, on, uh, on St. Clair Avenue, at one, above, above Martha's Delicatessen at 10712 St. Clair. I was about 11 or 12 years old. And I could remember one night hearing my parents count the pennies so they could pay a utility bill. I, 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 and I talk about this in the book. I could, I could actually hear the pennies dropping at night, you know, click, 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 as as they were counting the pennies to pay a utility bill. And so years later, I'm mayor of Cleveland, I'm in a room with the head of the bank and the, and the head of the city council, and they're trying to force me to sell the electric system. I could hear those pennies dropping in that apartment on St. Clair Avenue, and the pennies dropping all over the city where people wanted to have lower cost electricity. And I knew that if I went along with the privatization, that would be over. 
Cleveland would have been one of the largest public utilities in the country privatized. So I put my career on the line. I didn't know I'd be putting my life on the line, but here I am, you know, <laughs> spoiler alert. But uh, I'm, I'm grateful to have had the chance of serving in the, uh, in the office of mayor. And I'm looking forward to having the chance of returning to the United States Congress to work on those same economic issues that I've worked on my whole life for the people who I have represented who now live not in the city of Cleveland, but they're in the suburbs, they're in counties south of, uh, of Cuyahoga County, which is the county that Cleveland's in. What can a member of Congress achieve? What were you able to achieve and what do you hope to achieve as a member of Congress? Because of course, uh, there's a president in office and uh, with, with a lot of power. So how can you as one individual member of Congress shape our country's uh, trajectory? Well, first of all, I'm running as an independent. And the importance is this. I could very well be the only independent elected in 2024 because most independents don't go in with a strong political background or constituency uh, when they run for Congress. And I'm running in an in a, in a area that I, I served about half of it. So there's a pretty good chance I could win this race. If I am elected, and that's not going to just depend on me by any means, it could depend on some of your listeners who want to go to, or, or viewers who might want to go to Cassinich.com and figure out a way to help. But if I'm elected, I could very well be the only independent in a sharply divided Congress. And I'll be in a position with my knowledge of how the system works to, tr to point the country back to the Constitution, back to protecting our essential freedoms, which we will lose if we keep moving towards war. We're, we're already in a surveillance society. And as a member of Congress, I pointed out in the past when I voted against the Patriot Act, because I read it, the danger of giving the government the ability to reach into people's uh, private lives in the way the Patriot Act permitted it. Uh, you may remember with uh, when Libya was attacked, I had the Libyan uh, people from the Libyan government call me and say, why attacking us? We're trying to work with you. Those comments by the way, were picked up by one of the security agencies given to the Washington Times, which basically printed a transcript of a discussion I had with one of the Libyan leaders. Now, you look at how the CIA spied on Feinstein's oversight committee in the Senate. You look at how the security agencies are spying on Tucker Carlson right now. You look at what's been done to Assange for telling the truth. You look at uh, what uh, the corporations have done in this unholy alliance with the government. We have a real question of how do we protect our essential uh, freedoms, our freedom of association, our freedom of speech, all the First Amendment rights. They're under attack. I'm going back to Congress to protect the Constitution. I'm going back into Congress to protect that part of the Constitution that talks about how, how Congress shouldn't be spending money we don't have. Uh, and, you know, there's... There's a real need to start focusing on America, on taking care of things back here at home, on getting out of these wars, on getting away from the national surveillance uh, state. And I'm ready to carry that uh, forward into the next Congress uh, and help my colleagues who are obviously in a dither over this hyper-partisanship, which is crushing our nation and people know it. Uh, I, I stand for the American people. And, uh, you know, there, there won't be any label on my name uh, when, I, when people go to vote. This message uh, of taking care of needs at home rather than funneling, you know, all this money into these disastrous wars abroad, you know, it's traditionally a very standard progressive message. But in recent years, we've seen Republicans appropriate it. You know, Trump tried that in 2016 when he ran. He talked about, you know, America first and not spending all this money on disastrous foreign interventions. And we've sort of seen Democrats seed that ground because look at the Ukraine proxy war. Every single Democrat in Congress, including all the self-identified progressives, have voted for it. So what do you make of that by this, you know, this choice by Democrats to see the ground that you're staking, that we're going to focus on on needs at home rather than fund these wars abroad? You've just described why I can win this election, because I have I have solid Republican support because the message that I have is about fiscal cons conservatism something that very few Democrats want to talk about right now, 
but I will because I understand what happens when you waste money on war, when you put it on a credit card, when you take care of things all over the world and you don't think and things start to fall apart in your own country. And so that message is finding resonance and I think it's going to go across the political spectrum. I'm running to unite people, I'm not running to divide them. Uh, I'm stepping away from the kind of hyper-partisanship which has characterized our politics. And, I, and I'm, I'm ready to move into Congress as an independent at a time when I think people across the country are ready to support an independent approach in Washington. And this is as one member of Congress, but let me tell you, uh, you know, one who can make a difference can't do it alone, though. And that's why, uh, you know, your audience, if the people are interested, go to Kucinich.com. It could make a real difference in this campaign, because I think the way that I win is to get the word out that there's a different approach that's being advocated in, in Congress uh, once uh, I, I get back there. And what do you make right now of what's happening on Capitol Hill? As we're recording this, the Senate is advancing a massive bill, $60 billion for the Ukraine proxy war, uh, more than $14 billion for Israel to continue its assault on Gaza. And the split right now in Congress seems to be that Republicans, there's a faction that are reluctant to fund the Ukraine war, but everybody's on board with funding Israel. Um, what do you make of that current debate and um, how, you know, no, yes, there are some differences over Ukraine, but overall support for war is pretty much bipartisan. Well, again, it's about endless war. Think of what's happening. And, I, and I'm, look, I'm concerned about what happens to Israel. I don't want to see Israel wiped out. But what I don't understand is why the U.S. thinks that by furthering war in this region, that's going to help Israel. I don't understand how the party of Ben Gavir and Smotrich, uh, as uh, cooperating with Mr. Netanyahu, thinks that if they carry out their program of ethnic cleansing in Gaza, that that somehow is going to make Israel more secure. I think it'll make it less secure. You know, what can take a position on this without being, quote, anti-Israel? I'm not buying that for a second. I don't go along with any anti-Israel approach. But I will tell you this. Israel's survival could be affected by the United States fueling the war. Because let's be clear, when, when, when we try to drag Iran into a war, how does that help Israel? Yemen, Syria, reignite the war in Iraq. It's a lunacy. And we have to take care of things here at home. We have to quit spreading wars around the world. Whatever happened to diplomacy? Whatever happened to the State Department? Why has the State Department just become an arm of the Pentagon? Why aren't we as a country trying to find ways of helping our brothers and sisters reconcile their differences without killing each other? And so this is something that you know, my voice in Congress will raise these issues in a way that is not polarizing, that is not saying, well, we got to get rid of this person and that person in this country. That That's old thinking. That's lower limbic system conflicts. We, we have to uh, we have to consciously evolve as as a nation and in our politics to recognize that human unity is the underlying truth of our existence, that we're all one, we're interdependent, we're interconnected, and the human genome theory says we're 99.9% .9 made of the same stuff. Well, let me tell you something. It's, it's, about, it's about time that we called for a ceasefire. Finally, at last, there shouldn't have even been a fire to begin with, but it should be a ceasefire. We got to go back to making sure that people aren't paying another $97,000 out of their pockets, out of their needs for the next war. I, I'll tell you, I look at this and it is horrific. And, and, I, and people I talk to around uh, the, the greater Cleveland area and the 7th Congressional District, they're horrified about the direction the world's going in. People are really concerned, they're deeply concerned about it. And, and I'm ready to be their voice in stepping forward as a voice of sanity, common sense, and a willingness to say the obvious, like, War is stupid. And what do you think about uh, the way that the United States should be conducting its foreign policy? 
What should the United States be doing abroad? And to hear the rest of the interview, please go to UsefulIdiotsPodcast.com. Well, you heard the man, Ohio, 7th Congressional District, an actual peace candidate, an actual candidate who cares about the workers of this country. They're hard to find these days. So there's a chance to send him back to office this November. And you can also follow him on Twitter at Dennis underscore Kucinich. That's K-U-C-I-N-I-C-H. And make sure if you're not already a member, uh, you join UsefulIdiotsPodcast.com to see the full interview because he has some really spicy words to say about war, some very moving words, and he really takes on the war machine. He doesn't hold back. And the Thursday Throwdown, your midweek dose of media madness. You also get that. Don't deprive yourself, guys. That's Useful Idiots podcast.com to support the show and get bonus content like today's extended interview with Dennis Kucinich. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye guys. Thanks so much for listening to and watching useful idiots for extended episodes, bonus content and our weekly Thursday throwdown episode. Please subscribe at useful idiots podcast.com support the show for free by subscribing on YouTube rumble and wherever you get your podcasts. If you like the podcast, don't forget to rate and review. You can also follow us on Twitter at UsefulIdiotPod. Thanks for supporting independent media. We'll see you next time.